Amen. Amen. Such a, a wonderful message behind that song. Yes, Christmas is fun, but it's all about Jesus. That's the most important thing. And, you know, the, the cliche, he's the reason for the season, but it's true. And honestly, and it's good to hear a child testify of that, it's not about your presence, it's about his presence. And my list doesn't let me clarify that completely. But it's all about Jesus, not your stuff. So much easier to say. So much easier to say it like that. But it is. It's about Jesus Christ. If you'll be turning to Luke chapter 2, it's where we're going to start. Last week we looked at reactions of individuals. We looked at uh, Zacharias. We looked at Mary. We looked at Joseph and saw how they responded to the angel's call uh, when Gabriel came and told them what was going on. And this morning we're going to be looking at some of my favorite people and we'll get to them in just a second. But it's going to be Luke chapter 2. It's going to start with verse 1. And so if you want to stand, if you feel like standing, you can for God's Word. And Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 1, said, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of David, or out of the city of Nazareth, and into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem him because he was one of the house lineage of David to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife with being great with child and so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end let's go to the Lord in prayer our heavenly father we just Bow before you again, Lord, praising you for this baby, praising you that he didn't stay a child, that he grew, he matured, he perfected as a man, as God, Lord, that he lived a perfect, holy, sinless life, that he willingly went to the cross and that he died for us because he loved us. We thank you that he come out of the grave three days later. We thank you that our salvation is found in him, only by him, paid for by him, through him, and he keeps it, Lord. That, Lord, I pray if there be one here that does not know Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior, that they would believe today, that they would call upon Him today, they would find salvation today, and they would leave here today fully saved, fully desiring to follow Him. And Lord, that's my prayer for all, that we would all realize that our lives should be led to follow Him, that everything that goes on through, through Christmas, through the world, through our lives, that it should all be Christ-centered, that it should be focused on Him, that we should be fully surrendered to following Him. Father, we do lift up all the prayer requests that have been mentioned, those that are sick, those who've lost loved ones, those who are traveling, those who are going through whatever needs, Lord, we know that you are in control. We turn them over to you, trusting in your perfect, holy, righteous will. And Father, we just pray that as you watch over us through the days ahead, that we would constantly, continually, and always put you first, put Christ first, and be willing to give you all honor and glory, praising you, worshiping you, and willing to serve you. Father, we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Luke chapter 2. So we see here that Jesus is born. We'll probably rehash that a little next week, but we see that he's born. And so what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen? And now we're going to get to some of my favorite people, good old shepherds. I can kind of relate to shepherds. Now, we'll look tonight a little bit at wise men, but I don't relate to wise men. One, but thank you. I was waiting on my wife. I don't really relate to the wise men, not necessarily an intelligence wise, but they were they were kings. They're well dressed. They're rich. They got gold. They got power. I don't know what any of that's like, but I can relate to a hard working, smelly shepherd. I really can. I can relate to that. Most of us can probably relate to that more than anything. But these shepherds and shepherds are used in the Bible as a picture of Jesus. Jesus, of course, being the great shepherd. And I think it's so perfect that when the great shepherd shepherd is born, God goes and tells these other shepherds what's going on, and he uses the image of a shepherd and the flock perfectly throughout the Bible to describe our relationship with God as Jesus is the great shepherd, and we in that picture are sheep because sheep need to be tended. These shepherds took care of their sheep. They lived with the sheep. They stayed with the sheep. They protected the sheep. They fed the sheep. They did everything for the sheep. They gave their lives for the sheep if need be. And so that does picture our relationship with Christ 
And so what's going to happen here? Go back to where we're at. Start with verse 8. And let's see these, these shepherds introduced. So right after Jesus is born, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So there in verse 8, we notice that these shepherds are out working. They're outside, it's dark, it's probably cold, it's at least warm, and it's outside, it's in the desert, there's animals, there's sheep, they're, they're, I mean, it's not easy work. It says they're out there in that field, and they're watching over the flock, they're protecting the flock. This is a great picture of Jesus, that he watches and protects his flock. And notice in verse 9, it says, The angel of the Lord come up on them, the glory shone around them, and they were afraid. These are some brave men. We saw that last week with Zacharias, with Mary, with Joseph. They were afraid when God... These shepherds were very brave men. We know that they were armed with a staff and they were armed with slings and they were prepared to fight lions. They were prepared to fight wolves. But when the angel of the Lord appeared, they were frightened. They were thinking, oh, I can't fight this. What's going on? Somebody's going to lose some sheep. They were afraid. And what does he say in verse 10? It says, and the angel said to them, fear not. Those are my favorite words in the Bible, probably. Maybe not. Salvation probably is. But time and time again, God's people are told to fear not. If there's a message for us today in 2020, it's God's people should fear not. We should not be afraid of the virus. We should not be afraid of politicians. We should not be afraid of the world because we have Jesus Christ with us. So just like these shepherds, the message today to us is the same. Fear not. We should be bold. We should be brave because we are God's people. He says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. How great is that? Good tidings being good news and great joy being exceedingly joy. He says, I bring you the best news ever. Oh, wasn't it the best news ever? Now, I don't know, today there's nothing I can really compare that to other than the first time you hear about Christ's salvation. We all, uh, when you found out you were having a grandchild, I mean, that was great. When you found out you were pregnant, that was great. But that pales in comparison to hearing about Christ. So the only thing we can compare that to is the first time you went to a church service and heard about the fact that there is a Savior named Jesus Christ that loves you, that died for you, and that will save you if you'll simply believe. It's the same message today that it was then the Savior is here. Oh, how great that is. He said, it's great news. It's great tidings. Let me tell you all about it. He said, which shall be, and notice to who? To all people. Americans, north and south, east and west, red and blue, to Muslims, to Europeans, to men, to women, to short, to tall, to whatever variety of people you want to come up with, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all, and we're all saved the same way by believing in Him and asking Him to save us. Every one of us, no matter what color, shape, creed, nation, nationality, or tongue, are saved by belief in Jesus Christ. To all people. And it doesn't matter how good you are or how bad. Maybe that's why he testified to these shepherds. Shepherds kind of remind me of the hard-working construction crew or truck drivers. They may be a little rough around the edges, but God came to them. And he's testifying of them, telling them this great news. He said, I have this great news. And look at that great news in verse 11. Everybody knows Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Today, today, today is born a Savior. What a pronouncement. Your Savior and these shepherds living in Judea, they would have heard the prophecies. The prophecies go back six, eight hundred years ago. Hundreds of years ago, it has been prophesied that God is going to send a Messiah. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and see the promise that the Messiah is coming. So for hundreds of years, they've been looking. They get Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 and they see the 70 weeks. They count down. They know it's time. They know it's coming. And these shepherds are working and God shows up. These angels show up and say the Savior today is born and what does it say about the savior it's a savior which is christ the lord looking at those names savior means deliverer he will deliver us from the bondage of sin 
Oh, how sweet that is. Amen. Hundreds of years before this, the children of Israel was in Egypt, and they were praying to God for deliverer, and God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt, picturing Jesus Christ and our salvation. Here, God sends Jesus Christ to deliver us from certain death and give to us eternal life. Oh, what a word. But look at the next word, Christ. Christ means anointed Messiah. Lord means supreme in authority. So this is the deliverer, the Savior, the one who's bringing salvation, the one who is anointed for a specific purpose to be this coming Messiah, the one who is supreme in authority. This is the one and only Savior you will ever need because He's supreme, He's above all, and He can save all if all would believe. There's no greater Savior because there's only one and we don't need another. Jesus died on the cross and His blood on the cross was sufficient for the death of all mankind if all would simply believe. If we'd have a revival, there's like 8 billion people in the world. If we'd have a revival and 8 billion people at once cried upon the name of Jesus, 8 billion people would be saved that moment. He can save millions and billions at the blink of a twinkling of an eye. Oh, if everybody would turn to Him. You know what? We're talking billions. We can look here today. And the Bible says if one turns to Christ, the angels in heaven rejoice. There's one sitting here today and they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If they quit fighting, if they just surrender and believe in Christ, the Holy Spirit's convicting you now. I know He is. I can see it in your eyes. Holy Spirit's convicting you and you realize I'm lost. I need a Savior. I need a testimony. I have nothing. You're sitting there holding pews, holding the computer, looking at your phone, staring at the wall, or thinking about Fortnite. You're being convicted right now. And the answer to that conviction is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and then call upon His name and simply, honestly, humbly ask Him, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, please save me. At that moment, you today would be saved and that one salvation would cause all of heaven to rejoice. And I promise you, everyone in here would too but no one would rejoice more than you yourself the greatest day of your life is the day that you set Christ as your savior and truthfully it's the first day of your life if you're here and you don't know Christ you're dead in your sins and you don't even know it but the moment you trust Christ you are saved you are born you have a new man a new lease on life you are quickened you're brought back to life and you start your real life serving Jesus and you'll look back and go why didn't I do it sooner oh today could be that day but we see there in verse 11 they announce to these shepherds that the Savior has come and look at verse 12 down to verse 14. It says, And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, a, with, the, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. We've sung that song. We've seen that. We see these angels appear. So this other angel tells the shepherds, you're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's a little different. So you're going to see that. You're going to know that's a babe. And right then, as soon as they said it, this heavenly host appeared. And notice what they're doing. They're saying, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. Honor, praise, worship what we should be doing. Highest means supreme in heaven. Notice then it says, peace on earth. We know that Jesus came to bring peace, but it was not the peace that they were looking for. Is there still war on earth today? Yes. Was there war on earth then? Yes. That's not the peace we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus Christ was officially on earth, meaning how we can spiritually find peace in our lives is through Christ, and the way we find peace is to trust in Him, and He was physically born on earth that day. Thus, peace on earth. Amen. Peace is only found in Jesus Christ. The world tries to answer with so many different things. You can turn on the TV and you see alcohol commercials and they're just getting down, having a shindig, having a good time. But if they don't have Christ as their Savior, that's as fake as all get out. People search for answers in drugs 
They search for answers in relationship after relationship. They search for answers in all kinds of voodoo and hoodoo and all kinds of nonsense. But what everybody's searching for is the only way to have peace, the only way to have hope, the only way to have completion is to have Christ as your Savior. You say, but I have that and I still feel empty. Is He Lord of your life? If you're saved but you're not following Christ, then you're going to feel empty. You're still saved because once you're saved, you're saved forever. But if you're not following Christ, you're going to be miserable. It's kind of like the cliche saying, happy wife, happy life. If your wife's miserable, you ain't happy. If you're a child of God and you're not living your life making God happy, then you will be miserable. But you can fix that. How do you fix that? You pray to God and say, Today, Lord, today I want you to strengthen me. I want you to guide me. I want you to lead me. And from today, this moment, I will follow you fully. And that'd be the greatest Christmas you've had. And so we see these shepherds and we see that they promise, these angels promise them peace on earth, being that Jesus will be on earth. It says goodwill toward man means good desires and kindness. We are told to pray for our enemies. We are told to live lives where we are living testimonies, loving one another, being kind to one another. That's what he's saying. He's saying goodwill toward man. He's saying be good to everyone. He's saying Christ will be good to everyone. So what happens? What's going to happen? These shepherds were working. They see these angels. The angels proclaim the birth of the Messiah, the birth of the Savior, the birth of Christ the Lord, the birth of the one that's bringing peace. And look at verse 15. It said, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known to us. So the angels disappeared. And there's silence in the heaven. And the shepherds look at one another. You know it had to be tempting. It'd be tempting for us to say, Wow! All right, get back to work. We're on the clock. Wow! Well, that's something. The Savior's born, but we're too busy. We'll go sing when we get done. When the day's over, when we have time, we'll get around. He's a baby. He'll be around for years. We can go to it. We make those excuses today. We say, oh, I'll start serving God eventually. Oh, I'll put my faith in Christ when I feel like it. When I, when I sow enough wild oats. Oh, I, I got saved when I'm a child, but I'll follow Him later. I'll, I'll do it. It's too cold. It's too hot. Or I'm too busy. I've got all these ball games. I've got all... We make excuses. What do these shepherds say? Look at it again. It says, Let us go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come. Look at verse 16. It says, And they came how? With haste. That means they got up and they went fast. They were motivated. They were ready to go. They wanted to serve. They got up and they went with haste. They didn't let the dust slow them down. They didn't let obstacles show them down. I do kind of wonder what happened to the sheep. But it's not time, so shepherds would have really had the sheep kind of pinned up in a cave. They probably put a block in front of it and said, They'll be good. Let's go see the Savior. Oh, if we had that same kind of motivation, motivation today, we see the world getting shorter. We see the world getting worse. We see the time has to be approaching. We need to have haste about us to serve God. We need to be motivated to not let a second go to waste. And oh, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, don't let a day pass without knowing Christ as your Savior. This world does not promise you another day. We just heard a 38-year-old died of a heart attack. No one in that family, I promise you, thought that was going to happen. That's kind of nerve-wracking because I'm 36. 38 doesn't sound that old. People are supposed to die in their 90s. None of us are promised tomorrow. Car wrecks take people out every single day. If you're here and you don't know Christ, don't wait. 
But if you do know Christ, don't wait to serve Him. Don't wait to join a New Testament church and become active. If you're a member, maybe you're backslidden, you say, but it's Christmas time. That's a great time to decide to decide to worship God. That's a great time to decide from here on out. I, you know what? 2020 kind of stunk, but I'm going to make 2020 the best, 2021 the best year ever because I'm going to make it about Jesus. I'm going to make it about serving Him. You know what? 2021 may be the worst year humanly possible, but if you put Christ in the center of it, it's going to be a great year. 2020 was a great year if you focused on Christ. I think 2020 was a wake-up call for God's people to get serious. Back in March, they said, you know what? Now let's just close churches. And everybody said, okay. And then we found out, especially through New York, California and places, there become a political agenda about it. And the, surprise, surprise, you can't catch COVID in a bar at Walmart. You only catch it at church. It was a test to see how faithful God's people was. Now, yes, it's 100% real, but look at your Bible. If they went to church services, they may have been imprisoned and they may have been fed to lions and you're telling me that they still met knowing they were going to be beheaded, knowing they were going to be fed to lions. I tell you today, that God's people need to be faithful. It was a test, and there's still churches today shut down. There's churches with buildings that can hold thousands that are shut down. I promise you they could social distance. I promise you that. We're social distance, and we're not that big of a bill. I mean, God's blessed with an amazing building, but you know what I'm talking There's churches that look like football stadiums. And you wonder where the faithful are. 2021 is going to bring more trials. I mean, we see it today. It's, numbers are getting worse. Politically, the world's getting worse. And morality's getting worse. We're going to face a time where it probably will be illegal to meet. That may be 2021. It may be 2022. But God's people from here on out, we always have been tested, but now the testing's actually getting serious. We're going to have to answer the call. Kind of like a boxer that gets knocked down. We may have been knocked down, but we need to get back up. Will God's people answer the bell? Will we get back up and say, I don't care what the world throws at me. I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. That's why, look at this. Look back at 16. It says, and they came with haste. I love that because they were motivated and they got with it. They didn't form a committee. They didn't start taking votes. They didn't wait till the job was over. They got with it because they wanted to see the Savior. Oh, if we had people that wanted to see the Savior. It says they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. That classic Christmas scene. Oh, how great that would have been. They see Mary and Joseph and the baby. And what do they do? Look at verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. Notice what they did in 17. What is made known abroad? That means they went and told people what they saw. They were they were they weren't necessarily prophets, but they were kind of missionaries in a way. They weren't building churches, but they saw the Savior and they went out and told somebody. You know what I saw today? What I saw the Savior, Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. I saw Him today. Our salvation is here. Our deliverer is here. Our redemption is here. I saw Him. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine if we had that in our hearts today that we were willing to tell people, I know the Savior. And how did people respond? Verse 18, all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. It doesn't say that they got excited, does it? It doesn't say that they, oh, they came running to look. It doesn't say that they got saved. The same is for us today. We might run out. We may get some motivated. We run out, catch a car going down the road, flag them down, tell them about Jesus. But that does not mean that car is going to be excited too. In fact, they're probably going to be agitated because we flagged the car down. You may witness to 100 people today or next week or the next year. You may spend, maybe you make a motivation in your heart the next year. You tell 100 people about Jesus. 99 of them may say, I don't care. 
But what if that one listened? These shepherds went and told everyone about the Messiah. And they don't even know the whole story. We know the whole story. We have it in our hands. We have the completed work. We know what Jesus does. We can't just tell them about the babe in a manger. We can tell them about the Messiah on the cross, the fact that the tomb is empty, the fact that He saved me and He can save you. We can tell them so much more. These shepherds were willing. Are we willing? And then again, the warning is, most may not listen, but that one might. That one might be your child, it might be your neighbor, it might be your spouse, it might be your co-worker, it might be a random person at Walmart. But the angels in heaven, and we should as well rejoice over one sinner that comes to repentance. Oh, if we had that same spirit of these shepherds that we were just willing to tell others how many more people might come to know Christ. And look at verse 19, and it had to be overwhelming for Mary. It says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I love that word, pondered. She sat there and she thought about it. She was amazed as we saw a couple of weeks ago when, when they take him to the temple here in a little while. We won't look at it today. But they take him to the temple and the, the woman, prophet, and the man, they rejoice. And it says Mary just pondered those things. Here she sees these shepherds, these ragtag shepherds show up and she's probably thinking, what are, what's up with y'all? And they see the baby and they leave and they're like, we're going to go tell everybody about the Messiah. And she's like, How amazing that is. You know, we almost have that same feeling. If we see somebody come in and they get excited and they get saved and they get baptized and they're on fire, sometimes we have that, wow, wouldn't that be nice? Truth be told, we should still be that way. You've been saved for 80 years and you've got a remade hip and one eye. It doesn't matter. We should be so excited, but Christ is still our Savior. Always has been. Always will be. And we should be motivated if we have to do anything. If we can do simply nothing but pray. Or you know what? Even any of us can pick up a phone and call somebody. We should be willing to do what we can do for God. To praise Him. To worship Him. To spread the message. Oh, what we could do. These shepherds, when they're working, they never thought they were going to be. A few hours later, they're telling people about Jesus. Every one of us come from different walks of life. You may be truck drivers, school teachers. You may be principals. You may be insurance salesmen. You may be secretaries. You may be construction workers. Every one of us, no matter who we are, we all can tell somebody about Jesus. And we can all choose to live our lives for Him. Look at verse 20 now. Finish the story of the shepherds. It says, And the shepherds returned. So they got done telling the whole And I think they told the whole town. I think they told everybody. They told the potter, the baker. They told the nursemaid. They told the farmer watching. They told everybody. And they finally got done and said, Now what? And one said, Well, I guess we go back to work. All right. So they go back. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned. Notice what they're doing though when they come back. It says they came back glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. They still got joy in their heart. How many times do we come to church, sit through Sunday school, sit through preaching, go home, Sat down, never think about God again. Oh, we may wake up when the alarm goes off because we're faithful. We're going to go back at 6 o'clock. So we go back at 6 o'clock, have some more singing, have some more preaching, go home, and we'll think about God next Sunday. I've done that. You've done that. We know that. 
We should be like these shepherds. When we meet the Savior, we should tell others about the Savior. When it's finally time to go home, and every one of us eventually will have to go home, we will have to go to work because we need food on the table, we have lives, we have jobs, but notice these shepherds go back to work, but what's their attitude? They go back to work and they're still glorifying and praising God. We, today, when we leave here, we need to leave and we need to live the rest of the week glorifying and praising God. God. That's how we serve Him. Glorifying again means to honor, to praise, to worship. Praising God, and I love this one, Stan will love this one, has an ideal of singing. I think they went back to work and it's kind of like them seven stooges, seven dwarfs, whatever that snow white was. You know, whistle while you work, do do do. They went back to work singing praises to God. Oh, if we were singing praises to God throughout our lives. Wherever you're working, if you're whistling, I can't whistle. So if you're singing or humming a good Christian song, someone might come up and go, hey, what you singing? Oh, I'm singing about Jesus. What a testimony that is. What a testimony. So I can relate to these shepherds. I hope you have too. Hard-working individuals. Drop what they're doing to see the Messiah. The Messiah changes their life. They tell others. And you just get the idea. You just see in verse 20 that they go back to their lives, but their lives have been changed. They're on fire. They're joyful. They're exceedingly joyful. Then they're just singing praises and worshiping God. And I just get the idea that 30 years later, they're probably elderly, but when Christ starts walking around, there's some of the people there in the crowd singing, Hosanna, praise Him. You can just see that. So today, have you met Jesus? The Savior that saved the shepherds, that saved the wise man, that saved all the Jews, that saved everybody that believes in Him. Everybody that's ever been saved has been saved by belief in Christ, either looking toward His coming or looking back at His coming. That same Savior that saved them is today the Savior of the world. And today, if you're here and you don't know Christ, He can be your Savior. If the Spirit's convicting you, you feel it, you know it, you know you're lost, that's called conviction. If you're under conviction, you need to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and just simply call upon His name. That just means to simply acknowledge Him. Jesus, I believe You're the Savior. Please be my Savior. Please save me. I trust you as my Savior. However you word it, when you believe and you acknowledge it, at that moment you are saved and you can do that today and you will be saved for eternity. And you can face tomorrow with boldness, with confidence, with hope, knowing that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. Have you met Jesus? And then, if you have met Jesus, is He Lord of your life? It's one thing to say, yeah, I met Jesus, I got saved 50 years ago in a church service. Maybe 5 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. But when was the last time you truly let Him lead your life? Yeah, it's great to show up to services, but is Christ leading your life? It's kind of like being in a car. In the car, you have a driver and you have a passenger. The passenger can run their mouth all they want, but they can't actually turn that car. Only the driver steers the car. Where are you going with this? A lot of us want to put Jesus as the passenger and tell him, Lord, strap in, we're going for a ride. Truth be told, we should be in the passenger seat Letting Jesus take us where He wants us to go. Is He Lord of your life? As the song leader comes, the musicians come. Again, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Messiah, I pray that you would come to know Him. Pray that you would quit fighting it. Pray that you would stop uh, fighting it and just surrender. Find out what salvation is. Trust Christ and you can leave here today saved for eternity. And then, child of God, as we stand, if you need to come back and be faithful, if you've been backslidden, if Christ isn't leading your life, if you haven't been faithful, or maybe you just want to praise Him, you can do that today as we sing.